Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see this terrific crowd. It's wonderful to be here with Paul, that very rare species, the public arena figure, force of nature, man with a bullhorn who also has a Nobel Prize. <laughs> we spoke about a week ago, but things keep moving, and there's a lot more to ask. <laughs> I want to start right in with Europe. I expect a very large percentage of people in this hall tonight read your column this morning. But tell us anyway, you're here in the flesh and that's great. What just happened in Europe? What does it mean? Greece, France, Hollande, the end of Mercosy. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that's our, that's our entire evening, right? Good. <clears throat> no, but um, Europe is <clears throat> it's an amazing story, uh, by which you mean terrible. Um, um, and they kind of got themselves into a box because they really did create this single currency without a lot of the preconditions for the single currency. So this is a, they're in an inherently difficult position because they, they, are, it's, it's, they really don't have a, a setup where there are any easy answers, any good answers, uh, as opposed to us where there are actually easy answers which we refuse to, to take. Um, but, the, uh, <clears throat> but their answer, the actual strategy they followed is, is making the worst of a bad situation which is to define the problem as being entirely one of, of fiscal profligacy and to have their only policy tool be austerity, slashing spending, which is just all wrong. It's not, Greece, Greece was actually profligate, but only Greece. So I, I've been calling it the Hellenization of their problem. They, they're, 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 it isn't really all Greek. Um, and, uh, and it's just making things worse. So it's been this odd thing where the European elite uh, has defined the problem this way, and it's been sort of undiscussable to even suggest that maybe they're heading down the wrong path. And finally, the voters said, hey, we're, we don't like it. Now, it's kind of inchoate, because the Hollande is very careful, very, very vague in France. It's not clear exactly what he intends to do differently, but at least it breaks the, uh, the, axis, of, uh, of the axis of austerity between Paris and, and Berlin, so that there's at least a possibility of a rethink. Greece is more disturbing, because they're basically all of the reasonable, very serious people. I like that phrase. I borrowed it from us, but that's capital V, capital S, capital P. Very serious people. All the very serious people have bought into the notion that austerity is the answer, um, which means that the only people left to protest are, are the fringes. And so what you just saw in Greece is that the, 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 center, the centrist coalition um, is basically does not have a governing majority anymore, uh, but the parties on the fringe are, are seriously on the fringe. I mean, there's actually, let's put it this way, there's a lot, there's a lot of ghosts of the 1930s that seem to be walking around, increasing, becoming increasingly real, take, taking flesh as we speak. Golden Dawn, uh, neo-Nazis, Golden Dawn all the rest. Golden Dawn is neo-Nazis. Uh, you can see that. Um, take a look at some of the Jobbik rallies and uh, photos from them in, in Hungary, and you say, wait, what, what century is this? What decade is so There's a lot of scary stuff going on. So this is, it's very scary, but I guess the hope is that now that Mercosi, the, uh, the alliance between Angela Merkel and, and, and Sarkozy is, is gone, that, that at least we have some possibility that the Europeans will rethink. But wow, it's, uh, you know, it, it's been kind of a race between us and the Europeans as to see who can do worse. And for the, for the time being, they're winning. Uh, I guess that's, that's, a, that's a win for them that we're glad to have, but not so glad you're, you're talking about, writing about, the end of the EU, the end of the common currency. There's a very... You're saying it's an answer, maybe the answer. Well, it, it is an answer, and it's unthinkable, except that continuing down the current path is unthinkable. So I, I'm probably getting too deep into the weeds right away, but think Spain is actually the, the uh, Spain is actually the, the, uh, the epicenter. Spain did not, the Spanish government did nothing wrong. Spain was running a budget surplus before the crisis. It had low levels of debt, but it had a monstrous housing bubble as did a lot of places, uh, largely financed, by the way, by German banks, which were lending to Spanish banks, which then lent on to... And when the housing bubble burst, you were left with a severe, extremely severe recession, now almost 25% unemployment, collapse in revenue because the Spanish economy was badly hit. Uh, and, and so the answer has been government austerity, which just makes the slump deeper. Uh, what are Spain's alternatives here? They, what they would, if they still had their currency, the ants, uh, their own currency, the ants would devalue. Let the peseta drop, Spanish exports would become a lot more competitive, they'd be well on their way to recovery. Uh, they don't have their own currency, so people are saying, well, you have to do all this stuff to stay within the euro. At some point you say, well, you know, if, if your answer 
to our problem is just ever more suffering, ever more. You know, 25%, 50% youth unemployment. If that's, if that's the, your notion of a solution, then maybe, although it would be a very terrible thing to have the euro break up, maybe that's better than what we're doing. So that's becoming a real possibility now. I promise to come back to the States, but I think people are watching this very closely, and we're seeing shadows of our own situation here, or maybe some angle or yeah. facet of it, maybe one yeah. day. If, if breaking up is not the answer, and so they can't devalue, right. so they can't have a big export surge like Germany had, right. um, then they've got to spend to make things happen by the Krugman formula, right. but there's the bond market saying, we're lending, you squat. Well, there's a, so the, the important thing to understand is there, there is no, if you're the, if you're the, suppose that, that you are asked to, f by, by the prime minister of a small European country, for what, what should I do? Which is actually not a hypothetical. Uh, so suppose I'm asked by, and, and for us, uh, a hypothetical okay. for you, maybe not. Um, and the answer is that the that those those the prime minister of a small European country has only two options: the nuclear option of leaving the euro, which is a, a hell of a thing to do, uh, or kind of impose as much austerity as the Germans and the European Central Bank are demanding, in the hope that something will eventually turn up. So that's what they're doing. These alternatives to a breakup of the euro have to be Europe-wide solutions. So it's not that Spain needs to spend more. It's that Germany needs to spend more, and in particular, it's that the European Central Bank needs to accept some inflation. One way or another, Spa Spain has to have uh, the jargon, an internal devaluation. Or they ha they need, their, their, their costs and prices need to fall something like 20 or 30 percent relative to Germany. You can do that by having Spain try to cut costs and prices 20 or 30 percent through deflation. That's incredibly painful, incredibly expensive. Nobody ever manages to do that very well. Plus, it means that their debt burden gets even worse because it's worth even more in terms of purchasing power. Or you can do it by having Germany have its prices rise 20 or 30 percent over the course of the next uh, five years. And um, uh, so the solution, if there is one, involves accepting a higher rate of inflation for, for Europe as a whole, and that particularly means higher inflation in Germany. Talk to the Germans about this, and of course they, they go crazy, but, but you have to say to them, what is your, what is your answer? You're, you, what, you're, what you're doing right now is just a path to collapse of the euro with enormous damage and radicalization and, uh, and a lot of things that you don't want to see happen in Europe uh, happening. So if the Germans can't take their foot off the brake, they're just intrinsically right. and against history and everything else, Weimar, if they can't do it, what happens? Well, then, then you're a breakup. And, and, no, I mean, I think it's that stark. Uh, it, really is, it really is that extreme, because, you know, it's one of those things, you, you can't be saying that, but then you say, well, okay, let's, let's talk this through. Uh, you know, let, let's, let's uh, as I said in the original edition of The Godfather, let us reason together, right? <laughs> what, is, what, what, are, what are the ways that this can work out? And, and the current path is not one that can work out. So the alternatives are, are Euro breakup or a, at least moderately higher inflation in Europe. And the Ger it's, it's a funny thing about the Germans, actually. Why it is that they obsess over the 1923 inflation, which was very terrible, but sort of have forgotten about the 1930 to 32 deflation under, uh, under Chancellor Brüning, which is what actually immediately paved the way for you know what. Uh, I don't know, but they've, um, but they've got, uh, so this is, this is where it comes down to. And it's one of the, you know, what I think is gonna happen to Europe is kind of, it's, it's like an irresistible force hitting an immovable object. On the one hand, it's unthinkable that they'll allow the euro to fail. Because the euro is a terribly important thing. It's a, it, not terribly important economically. They would be better off if, they've never, if they had never done it. Um, but now that it has been done, for it to fail is a defeat for the European project. The whole project of bringing peace, democracy, integration to a continent with a terrible history. But if, they're up but if they don't, yeah, if they're but, up if they, granite. but if they won't let that, so the, it's unthinkable that they'll allow it to fail, but it's also unthinkable that the Germans will accept moderate inflation, which is the only solution any of us have been able to come up with. So one of two impossible things is going to happen. Your bet. Could it be like the moment Sorry. in the cowboy movies where the bullets are flying all over the place and the, and the, ga the gang says, hey, we've got to break up, we'll meet back in, in Europe's case, 20 years. Well. Go off and devalue. Put the ideal no. on the shelf, see you in 2032. Well, it's, no, but it's an enormous mess. If, it, if they break up, for one thing, it's, uh, you've got a, somebody in Greece owes you some money. Uh, is that money, the contract says euros, but does it become a contract in new drachmas? Uh, what, what, what happens there? So it's an enormous mess, but, 
Um, not, you know, not, not the solution, not the, the right solution. And I actually think they could do this, they could work this out with more flexibility, um, with, with moderate inflation. But, uh, so I, I'll tell you, we, when my wife and I were at an event uh, um, a year and a half ago, actually, um, with, uh, in, in Germany, and, and Wolfgang Schäuble, the, uh, the finance minister, was the speaker. And he, uh, uh, who's, I, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's sincere and he's, he's serious, uh, but it's always, uh, basically, let's put it this way, he, partway through, my wife took off her, her headphones for the translation just to watch the body language. She just began, ch and, began and then, channeling German And then she, then she turned to me and she said, as we leave this room, we're going to be given scourges with which to whip ourselves. Because it was all morality and debt is evil, but you know, this is not a morality play. You have to find answers, and the question is whether the Europeans in general and the Germans in particular can accept the fact that, that, that this is not going to be about punishing the guilty, especially because in many cases they're actually, the people suffering most had nothing to do with creating this crisis, which is true here as well. Paul, bring it home. Level of difficulty, Europe versus the USA. US, uh, the economics is easy as, as anything. If we had uh, the political will and the intellectual clarity, um, we could be pretty much fully recovered in, in 18 months or two years. So it's, it's tremendously easy. If we, um, let's put it this way, I, I actually have some fun. I, I uh, and, and some other people have done this too. You can find articles. Actually, so I'll give you um, Dean Baker, who's uh, uh, Center for Economic Policy Research in Washington. Progressive did, economist. Yeah, did something I, I had done with a more, he, he had a, he quoted from, at length from a, an article in the Washington Post about how we really just can't have a full recovery because businesses can't find the skilled labor they need even though there's high unemployment and just not, and only at the end did he actually tell you, actually it's a story from the Washington Post from 1935. Um, and in this depression now, I actually have a, a more learned thing from the Journal of the American Statistical Association saying the whole thing. So we were in a situation very much like what we're in right now um, at, in the late 1930s. Nothing could be done, you know. And then along came, uh, not even the war, but actually just the, the threat of war, and we began the rearmament, which was, ended up being a large fiscal stimulus. Um, and lo and behold, we had full employment within two years. Um, if we could do something like that now, it would be very quick. Uh, we could. So I, I you suggested. Just had two wars for ten years. Well, they're small. What do you want? And, and they're, Bigger they're, wars. Well, yeah, I want. I want. Of course, I don't want wars. I want. To, so actually, so I actually suggested facetiously last year that that if we need to invent a fake threat from space aliens, uh, <laughs> so as to. It's been done. But it's been done. But but the but the reality actually is that it's now it, it's now actually much simpler. Three years ago, there was a question: if you're going to try and do this boost to the economy, what do you spend the money on? Now, what's actually happened in the past three years is we've had huge cutbacks at the state and local level. 300,000 school teachers laid off, 600,000 uh, state and local workers altogether, whereas normally, we've just been growing with population, or growing as we did during the comparable period of the Bush administration, um, we would have 700,000 more. So simply providing federal aid so that you can rehire those school teachers, rehire those policemen. Even if you're not uh, building a new energy gri right. uh, grid uh, space. Right there, right there, you can get 1.3 million new employees in the public sector right away. Right there, just by resuming the road repairs. I don't know about here, but the roads in, in New Jersey are full of potholes. Uh, just well, they're resume. fantastic here. Right. <laughs> um, so right there, right there, uh, right there we, we have the, all it would take to get the unemployment rate below 7% very quickly. Uh, it would be easy as, as, as anything. It would, it would, and, you know, with no problem at all to do it, except politics. Which I want to pause on a minute because that is the big bugaboo in your book. But first, justify your title, End This Depression Now. You mentioned 1935. You say the word depression, people right. think 1930s. Is that the parallel you're making? You know, it's yeah. hard to, to think across history. Is Paul Krugman really saying we're in a depression like that depression? What? Yeah. Are we? Yes, we are. I mean, it's not as bad. You know, wonderful. It's not as bad as the Great Depression. This is this is a, a great recommendation for the state right. of the economy. Um, uh, Four more years. Uh, but the but first of all, uh, terminology. A recession is when things are going down. A depression is when things are down. Uh, we are a deeply depressed economy. We have, uh, you know, it, we it it's not it's not collapsing. But that wasn't true for all of the 1930s either. In the period we call the Great Depression. Uh, was a terrifying slump from 1929 to 33, a, a fairly fast 
recovery, but insufficient from 33 to 37, a second leg down in 37, 38, another leg up. It didn't really end until the, uh, we got close to war. Um, but it was a prolonged period. Throughout that period, unemployment was ho very high. Lots of people were suffering. How much worse than now? Well, it's an interesting thing. At the, night, with the data, of course, are not so good then, but uh, by modern concepts, we believe that in 1937, uh, the unemployment rate by modern concepts would, would have been about 9%. Not but we're actually right not that much better than we were in 1937, right? It's not, it, people say, oh, this is nothing like the Great Depression. Well, there were years that we considered part of the Great Depression that were not much worse than what we're going through right now. And we have now, uh, the number I always come back to is we have almost 4 million Americans who've been out of work for more than a year. Just think about that. That's, that and there's been nothing like that since the 1930s. That's totally destructive. That's destroying people's lives. It's destroying their, their attachment to the workforce. It's, it's a catastrophic uh, uh, impact. And, and that's, that's enough to say this is, not, this is not something that you can describe with the ordinary language of recession and recovery. This is something that is really terrible. And the damage is accumulating as we speak. Uh, you say that short-term damage at that level is really long-term damage. That's right. There's a lot of evidence that if you keep people uh, unemployed for really long periods of time, they'll never, uh, if they, uh, many of them will never, never manage to be employed again. They've, they've lost, whether they are capable of working again, um, they're likely to be ruled out by employers. Um, and then there's the young. So that what's happening to recent college graduates, mm. I mean, what's happening to recent high school graduates who aren't going to college is terrible too, but the college graduates is where we can get a, a really pretty good picture of what's happening. Um, they have an unemployment rate. You, know, you keep on hearing about how college education protects you from the worst. Recent college graduates have an unemployment rate that's higher than the population at large. Uh, lots of the p them who do have jobs are working part-time involuntarily. Many of those who have full-time jobs are earning remarkably low wages because, guess what? They can't find jobs that make any use of their education. Or no wages. Or no wages. Interns. A lot of interns. Um, but that's only among the class that can even afford to do right. that. So, um, and we also we have a fair bit of evidence on you know, when when will college students who graduate into this economy, assuming that the economy eventually recovers, how long will it take them to make up for the lost ground? The answer is forever. If you if you graduate into an economy where there are no jobs, then even if you do eventually get employed, your career is scarred forever. Which also means that we as a nation don't get to make use of the intelligence of the human capital of these people. So we're- If it's forever, it's not just their problem, it's the nation's problem. That's right. Today, you know, today's uh, graduates are tomorrow's taxpayers. And if you want to worry about what uh, taxpayers, uh, you know, coworkers, whatever, if we're destroying the, the future lives of millions of, of, of young people, which we are as we speak, uh, then we're going to pay a price for it for decades to come. So. Uh, if you were king of the mountain, you'd hire back all the public sector workers who have been laid off in, the, in all those jobs that have gone uh, empty in the last couple of years. And what else? Give, give us your simple formula and then we'll look at why it's not happening right, right. now. The main thing is a big slug of aid to state and local governments to get, not just to rehire the ones who've been laid off, but to get back on normal track, to get, get back to normal classroom sizes, get back to normal levels of staffing and police departments. That right away is a lot, gets us most of the way to a What's a big slug? Recovery. Is it like stimulus, tr well, trillion about, dollar level, it's 900 about, it's billion? About, it's about 300 billion a year. Uh, that, that is what it would take right now, which is about 2% of gross domestic product, which would raise, expand the economy by about 3% relative to where it otherwise, you know, you can go through the math. 300 billion, is that? 300 is billion is per year. Anything else, Dr. Krigman, you'd like? In the yeah, so let's, so let's, we can probably come up with some, uh, I mean, there certainly are, God knows, infrastructure projects that, that are worth uh, doing that we know pretty much what to do. And of course, I have a personal pet peeve, which is the, um, uh, the, uh, the tunnel under the Hudson River that my, our one, uh, sorry, wonderful governor, Go Governor Yells at People has canceled. Um, and I live in New Jersey, in case you're wondering. Um, and uh, I'm supposed to follow that with, you got a problem with that? You got a problem uh, with that? Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, um, but there's a fair bit, so there's some other stuff, but I think the core of, a, of an immediate short-term spending strategy is simply restoring those state and local budgets. Then mortgage debt relief, which need not, we, there are some cases where clearly debt forgiveness is going to be worth doing, but the thing we can do right away and very quickly is simply to uh, waive the rules so that people who have low or negative equity can refinance at lower interest rates. Another big slug of aid to the economy. That can be done very quickly. Um, my former department chairman, uh, now, devoted, uh, now, now uh, demoted 
uh, to running the world. Man, who um, hired you? That's right. You ungrateful uh, wretch. Right. Well, I'm doing. No, I'm, I'm um, helping him. Uh, yes. It's an intervention on his behalf. Anyway, it's. it's, it's uh, but Ben Bernanke, he, actually, he he has a, he has a board too. So there has to be. The Fed can. The Fed can signal. Mostly, what it can do is it can signal that it's going to be in no hurry at all to raise interest rates. That it's willing to allow inflation to rise some, which would help, probably not by itself enough, but combined with these other things. Would he has said 2014 at these rock no, no, bottoms. But that's, but that's, it, you, you actually run it through, it's way too close. Uh, the more important thing is not until, he really should be setting a target for, for prices that says we're going to have something like 3% inflation over the next five years. Um, so all of those things. Can he do that if, his, if uh, half his governors say no or no, half his? No. So there's a, now. So does he really? Wh what are you saying when you complain about Bernanke's handling of that? Be more persuasive with your mates in the Fed, Ben. No. He, the thing is, he. But he's not making that case. He is claiming to believe that it's a bad idea. Even behind closed doors, you're. Well, you're I confident? don't know. Well, that's a good. Yeah, he hired you. Does, you he have, maybe does he have a lot? Don't, well, don't talk, uh, all, no, he don't, we don't. Uh, which, by mutual consent, I would be mm -hmm. too too dangerous, uh, explosive here. Yes. Um, Paul Krugman. But he's got a. I'm, I'm hoping that he has a locked locked desk drawer, within which is this notebook where he actually says, In you know, case of Krugman and Woodford and Svensson and a whole bunch of other people who all agree with me are actually right. Uh, I was right when I, when I called for a higher inflation target back in 2000, so, but, but who knows? But he, what, what he needs to have right now from the outside is someone making that case. He's been getting all of the sniping at him has been coming from the right, from the people who's, who claim that he's, he's going to turn us into Zimbabwe. And he needs somebody saying, no, actually, we're 10,000 percent inflation. Right. Mm -hmm. to, turning us into, into a second Great Depression. So, um, thing, so if, if we could wave away the politics, uh, it could be done very quickly. Um, in the real world, well, this is why we write books, right? To make a case to, to pound on this so that, that people understand that none of this has to be happening. Let's go to the politics, and then we will come in uh, five minutes to your questions at the microphone here. Um, if it's so clear uh, that this is what the country needs, yeah. and presumably no one has an interest in the country's depression as such, right. but maybe I'm wrong about that, why isn't it happening? What's standing in the way of this kind of solution, if you're right? There's a couple of things. Um, that, uh, and of course, by the way, I am right. Uh, of course. <laughs> worth, worth, worth pointing out. Um, oh, and there's one thing that's actually important to say, by the way, on that, which is that from the way it's framed, you'd think that people like me or like Joe Stiglitz are, you know, wild-eyed radicals and unconventional. And um, we're actually the ones who are preaching basic textbook economics, the time-honored stuff. If you had learned your economics from Paul Samuelson's classic textbook, you would be recommending exactly what I'm recommending. So all of these things that pass for sensible, reasonable opinion come from people who've decided to throw out the textbooks, throw out the lessons of history, and make up their own version because it suits their prejudice. But you're including economists in that number of people. There are some in that group. Not, not as many as you might think. A lot of the people that you're, you're hearing from are not actually economists, but there's stuff that goes on. So, so let's talk, actually talk just for a second about the economists. Um, we did have a great schism in economics uh, more than 30 years ago as one group, uh, influential group, large part of the country, decided that uh, Keynesian economics, all of this stuff that I'm talking, has to be wrong because it can't be fully justified in terms of theorems and axioms and, and rigorous math. And uh, um, so there's a whole project of trying to rebuild macroeconomics in a different way, which has failed. That project has been completely unable to account for a lot of facts about the economy. That was true even before. The outline crisis. of that project is what? What? Th th that pro that oh, equilibrium. Uh, I can get, uh, but but it's the notion that that basically recessions are something that happen as a rational response to temporary losses of opportunities. It's uh, so it's like the weather in Texas. Just it's very much. It's very. The, if you actually. They don't like it when you do this, but if you boil it down, it's like saying that, uh, that when, it, when, it's, uh, when it's rainy outside, the farmer stays home for the day. That's actually, a, that's actually what's going on in their models. Okay. Um, but, what, 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 but with lots and lots of math, so that it's, it, looks, yeah. it looks sophisticated, and, and the, the underlying... So we should just ranges. endure it, and the spring right. will come again. That's right. Uh, you know about Chauncey Gardner? And, yes. Uh, Chauncey Gar there, there's a, when Ben Bernanke gave a speech in, in early 2009 about green shoots in the economy, uh, it, it, 
I wonder if there was something subconscious going on, because it was almost verbatim, the speech in the, in the movie Being There that Chauncey Gardner gives uh, about, uh, to the president about uh, the, blossoms, uh, the, the will. blossoms will return in the spring. And, anyway, um, but um, so, so that's one thing. But I'm not sure You're how... You're going to have a it, great reunion with Ben Bernanke. I know. Today. <laughs> uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, the, uh, but more important, I think, in the political domain, um, what has happened, it has always been the case that a large part of the political spectrum just hates the idea that the government can do anything to boost the economy in a slump. And they hate it not so much because they have a really reasoned argument against it as because of the implications. If the government can do useful things for the economy, then maybe it can do useful things generally, which means that it might, might want to actually raise money to pay for those things by taxing uh, billionaires. Um, and also, the great standby of people who are opposing any kind of attempt to make the economy less less uh, unjust, uh, uh, le take some of the rough, rough edges as, oh, but that would destroy confidence. And if you destroy confidence, then that will do terrible things. And so um, if you say, well, you know, actually the way to create jobs is not to try to win the confidence of businessmen by, by saying nice things about them, but to actually go out and create jobs, that takes away a large part of their bargaining position. And so those thi two things together have led to a constant go way, all the way back, um, constant assault on the notion. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a concerted effort to stop Keynesianism from being taught in U.S. universities back in the 1940s. It was, it was a, and some, some textbooks were actually killed by... Already by then. Already then. So even then, even with the, with the memory of the Great Depression still very fresh yes. in people's minds. So over the decades, as the economy was relatively stable, that point of view gained force, backed by a lot of money, by an elaborate network of think tanks, propaganda organizations. Um, and so the, the notion that we could do anything useful uh, got lost. Then as in this crisis, at the moment that the acute phase passed, there was this hijacking to say, oh, well, the problem is not really unemployment, it's actually the budget deficit. And, um, and so that's, that's how we lost the thread. It's a powerful, powerful uh, set of, of, of opposition. Um, but it's always critical to remember that it's not, it's not about the economics. The, the, the economics is actually quite easy. It's only, it's only politics that's standing in the way. You've written in recent days that inequality is at the heart of the, the heaviness of the foot on the brake here. That, that, that's right. Th why? Well, because those two stories I gave you about why the right doesn't like the idea that you can do anything to, to help the economy, those are stories that essentially favor the interests of, of the wealthy. Um, and the wealthy have gotten a lot more powerful these past 30 years because they've gotten a lot more wealthy. So if you think that the, the, that, uh, that the arguments that say, well, we mustn't do anything to create jobs except try to convince businessmen that we like them, uh, if, if you think that that's, uh, that that's a key argument, uh, that's an argument that really is an argument that's not even from the 1%, it's from the 0.01%. And it's got to matter in terms of the force of that argument that the 0.01% uh, is five times as rich relative to the rest of us as it was 30 years ago. There was an argument made over the weekend in the New York Times magazine by a 0.01 percenter who happens to work for Bain Capital, uh, Mitt Romney's firm, saying, yes, there's an inequality problem, we need more of it, because inequality prompts people to do great things, innovate, build new companies, right. and what about it? Amazing. We need a lot more of it. Right. Quite a bit more. And there's so many, there were so many things you could go after, but the amazing thing there is he's relying on uh, people having absolutely no memory of, of what this country was like for the first 30 years after World War II. Right? We had a middle class society with very limited inequality. Um, gee, were we stagnant? Actually, that was the best generation of economic growth America's ever had. Were we not innovative? Gosh, an awful lot of uh, innovation took place in that period. So this notion that only the wealthy who will spend not all of their money uh, building mansions bigger than the Taj Mahal, uh, but some of it on, on, uh, on investing in, in venture capital can cause innovation, requires that you sort of sen send, send the way America used to be down the memory hole and imagine that only the society we have now, that this is the best of all possible worlds, which... Uh, which no, is, no, it's oh. not unequal enough. We need more Facebook-scale right, opportunities to provoke innovation. Yeah. Uh, Entice it. Yeah, somebody. Take I think, the risk. Uh, I just—I think it was Mike Kinsley just said. So you really think that—that that, uh, if, if uh, you know, 
I forgot what the number is, but Mark Zuckerberg had thought he'd only make six billion instead of 12 billion, he wouldn't have created Facebook. I know, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, you mentioned post-World War II and how well we were doing, but then a lot of people say, but you know, Paul, it's not post-World War II anymore. We, the structure of the global economy is fundamentally different. We've got competition like we never had then, and uh, it's just not working the way it worked then, and it won't again. Why does competition stop us from hiring school teachers? Right? How about steel workers? But it doesn't have to be steel workers. It can be lots of other okay, things. Okay, how about That's solar panel manufacturers? But remember, those are not... Gone. Ah, but something has got actually U.S. manufacturing is doing pretty well. Uh, if you look at the recoveries, manufacturing is leading it. Uh, so those things are not, and just to step back, um, we had, there was a great, uh, so there, there's a new uh, uh, organization called the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, which, I, which I approve of, and I think it's doing great stuff. But after one of their conferences, one of the, co uh, one of the participants wrote on his blog, you know, it seems like new economic thinking starts with rereading old books. Um, and if, which is true, although many of the details are different, this is very recognizably the same kind of thing that we've been through before. You read uh, Keynes uh, from the 1930s, you read Irving Fisher, you the read New Walter, threats rising, you, China equivalents, India equivalents, really? Well, all, there was all of that then. I mean, we, yes, Maybe the, the United, US was the rising threat. The United threat. States is, an open, is, is, is more open to trade than it was, but Great Britain in the 30s. They were a trading economy. That didn't stop, you know, John Maynard Keynes was a Brit, not an American. Mm -hmm. okay, that didn't stop him from thinking that, that, thinking correctly that fiscal stimulus could take Britain out of the Great Depression. So the notion, or, you know, my, uh, Walter Badgett, writing in the 1870s, actually it was telling a better story about what we need to do for our economy now than nine-tenths of the politicians in Washington. So this is, this is not, th this is, people are making up, making up reasons not not to fix this. What about that deficit? It is darn big. Yeah, gee, it's, uh, it's, it's a big number. Everything about America is a big number. Uh, that was a, I mean, I don't like it, but you know, people who are with actual money on the line, uh, bond investors are willing to lend the U.S. Uh, money long term at 1.9% interest, uh, and they're, if, you, if, if they're buying inflation protected bonds, the interest rate on 10 year Treasury inflation, inflation protected securities is minus 0.2%. They're willing to actually lend the US government money at negative interest rates because they think it's the safest place to put it. So the deficit is not a clear and present danger. And people make up, there was this wonderful, I guess I won't say who, but one, one pundit you know, opined that, well, maybe Keynes made sense in the 30s, but the countries then didn't have the level of debt. But turns out that Britain had a higher level of debt relative to GDP in the 30s than we do now. Uh, it's not, it, this again, it's something to worry, I, it's actually something else I should say. The austerity now, in the name of holding down deficits, doesn't even help your fiscal position because it shrinks the economy, which means that revenue falls, so you lose, you know, cut spending, part of it goes right away, it goes right down the drain through lower revenue, plus all of those things we were talking about before, about how it hurts your future, which also means it hurts your future revenue. And so the actual, the reality is that slashing spending because you're worried about the deficit actually makes things worse on all counts. Uh, we are like, at this point, like medieval doctors who thought that the cure for illness was to bleed people. And then when they did that, of course, the people got sicker, so they said, let's bleed them even more. And that's, that's basically our description of economic policy right now, an amazing thing. Um, I want to go to questions in just a moment, but Paul, yeah, you and I have been talking off and on for the better part of 10 years now. And uh, I've seen all kinds of terrain in your emotions in that time, and I'm just curious about your emotions, because I've seen you with some pretty rugged moments, and we've all read you at pretty fired up moments in your column. We know that you bring a lot of passion to this. Right now, you're out with a book called In This Depression Now, exclamation mark, right. and you're all sweet reason. What's going on, Dr. Krugman? No, <laughs> but it's always the same thing, right? Uh, no. If, if you're being reasonable, let's put it this way, if, if, you're not, if you're not angry, then you're not paying attention. And if you're not, uh, you're not thinking it through. So I'm, I'm being reasonable now because the fact of the matter is that sweet reason, if you like, says we can do this. Um, and uh, uh, and I, I do think that, okay, there, there's, there's tremendous political obstacles here. There's, there's a lot of vested interests, but there's, but there's also just plain failure to understand stuff. And I think if, if more people can be just persuaded to look at, look at what's really happening, then then we can make a lot of progress. This is, this is, one, no, this is one case where, where just understanding can be an enormous force for, for, for better. Um, 
and to add one more thing, it so happens, I sometimes feel guilty about this, um, this crisis is as if the gods decided to create a crisis that played precisely into the stuff I've been working on for the past 20 years. It, my <laughs> academic work happens to have been, you know, so, so in some ways I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling intellectually extremely comfortable because this is, this is the crisis that uh, I and, and some other people have been preparing. So, but the point is, I, I, in this case, it, it really does seem very clear what needs to be done, and I'm trying to, to get it done. Channel your, that anger for just a minute. How, what stick of dynamite do you put in the politics to change them then? I mean, here we are sitting. You, you say there's a depression on, there's parallels to the 1930s. There are not bricks coming through these windows. What's your advice on politics to people who are really suffering the distress that you're talking about, others who fear that they may, and others who just fear for the country? Well, uh, this is why um, we still have a democracy, uh, mostly, um, and people need to... People need to find the right targets for, the, for their, that, that anger. They need to blame it on the people who are actually responsible for keeping us down, not on, on you know, the, the, uh, the cooked up villain of the moment. Um, they need to be active politically. Um, they need to write to, uh, to, their, to their representatives, but also, also to journalists, by the way, who are, in my experience, um, is, are remarkably thin-skinned. And if you have bad reporting, which isn't, you often do, um, telling people, hey, that's bad reporting, it makes a big difference. Um, look, I, I think if, if, there is a, if there is a route out, it's going to rely on, it's going to come from, ultimately from the political system, uh, from politicians realizing that, that there is suffering that is feeding anger, that is leading to something that they really don't want to see. I mean, I, I'm not happy with, I'm, I'm actually fairly happy with the French election. Uh, the Greek thing is scary, but I think better to have that wake-up call than not. Better to have people understand that this is really serious and it is spinning out of control, um, rather than sit there in a state of complacency and think that serious policies are going to be the answer. Paul Krugman, the new book is End This Depression Now. Let's applaud and then ask questions. Thank you for your comments. Uh, just uh, a basic question. What you're proposing is increased stimulus and spending to almost deliberately create inflation to actually make the debt less costly right. to, to refinance, whether for Greece or for America. And yet we have the past few years, two or three percent inflation here in the United States. And we have the danger that if there's a real crash of our currency value, we all pay a price, not just the unemployed and the poor. What kind of inflation should we actually be shooting for? And how do we avoid having a crash like Germany had in, what is it, 19? 1923. 23, so when their currency absolutely failed. We don't that's, know our a, days. that's the threat that we face that scares no. the heck out of us in spite of you. But it, it's the, it, but it oh. shouldn't be scared. That's a misunderstanding. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I've been saying three to four. And what we've actually had, um, when three you to four strip percent out, per three to four annum. percent just, per annum for, for, for about five years. Um, the, what we've actually had, so some of that, some of the inflation you're see, we've seen in the last couple of years is, um, is, is oil prices, which fluctuate up and down. And so depending on exactly when you start that rate, let's not get too far into it, but it's significantly more than what we now have. And inflation is not the whole story, but it's part of it. What happened to Germany in 1923 was not that out of the blue, the currency collapsed. What happened was that you had a government that was incapable of collecting revenue, incapable of selling bonds, of borrowing, that relied on the printing press to pay its bills. We are nowhere close to that. So there's this weird myth, I've seen it quite a lot, that, that it's like any day now you can turn into Weimar Germany or you can turn into Zimbabwe. It doesn't happen. Hyperinflations happen because of a specific, hyperinflations basically only happen when governments are completely, uh, have completely lost their ability to, to administer, have completely lost their ability to raise revenue. Ben Bernanke calls your proposal very reckless odd because he made the same proposal himself 12 years ago for Japan. <laughs> um, and uh, I think there are, I mean, I understand that there are, I, I wouldn't say that there are zero risks, so I think they're pretty low. But the thing you bear, always want to bear in mind is that the risk of continuing as we are right now, it's actually not even a risk, the certainty of the continuing damage of sticking with current policies is enormous. And so I think you should be prepared to take some risks. Uh, 
I'm, I, I actually don't see, uh, we have no trouble actually keeping inflation from going above, let's say, so 4%, by the way, is the inflation rate during Ronald Reagan's it second term. It was 3% term. last year. What? No, that was, that was transfer. So the underlying inflation measure was under 2, just to say that. And the, um, the I mean, how can I say this? The, it, is, it astonishes me that given the reality of catastrophic unemployment, catastrophic long-term unemployment, people, instead of being frightened of that, are frightened about hypothetical inflationary breakouts, which are nowhere on the horizon. You know, deal with the problem we have, and, and um, I actually have a proposed, you may know about Godwin's Law. Godwin's Law is, that you, originally it was any sufficiently long internet discussion ends with somebody, with people accusing each other of being like Hitler. But it's become that the first person to bring Hitler into the argument uh, loses uh, the argument. And I, I want to propose that the first person to mention either Weimar Germany or Zimbabwe is considered to have lost the argument. But you're confident the Fed can reel it back in on the other side? Yes. They have the tools. They have Bernanke expressed some no, question. No, no, he has. So we don't want to put at risk the credibility we've built yeah, for decades. Yeah, but, but he, he's also said on other occasions that we would have no trouble controlling inflation. Sir. My question is enlargement on the question which Tom asked about five or ten minutes ago. And asking you to quantify your answer to his question, namely, what are the obstacles to following your excellent suggestions? And I'm dividing my question into three parts. One, economic obstacles, if right. they are such. <coughs> Second, political, which already was mentioned. But the third one was just touched lightly on, namely, uh, what is described in yesterday's uh, magazine, New York Times magazine, uh, under the title, page 50, those who want to look it up, Obama's date with Wall Street, where it shows that top financial figures, not all of them as generous, uh, generous as Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, and top business figures are necessary to raise the money for elections. And this is a built-in problem because the elections cost billion dollars. You raise five million okay. in a day or something like that. Obstacles, thank Could you. Could you no. quantify which of those is the most important? So the economic obstacles for the United States are nil. There's no, there is no problem. If we, if we actually did have that fake space alien threat, we would find the money, no problem, and we'd have the full recovery. That, that, that simple. The, the, Europe is a, is a more troubling case, but the United States, no problem. No economic obstacle. Political obstacles, obviously. We have a uh, uh, scorched earth politics. We have even a lot of Democrats who fall for, the, uh, um, the, for bad arguments. So it's not so easy. That's a very hard one. The role of Wall Street, or generally of money, that's, I mean, that's part of the political problem. Uh, it's also, there, there are more subtle things. I actually think that, that pol policy in the first couple of years of the Obama administration was skewed, was not as effective as it might have been because, um, because they took the advice of, of Wall Street people too seriously. Uh, the, the, uh, Wall Street has a kind of magnetic pull that can, can distort policy in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not just the campaign contributions, it's the, it's the revolving door, uh, the, the attraction of, you know, what, what do I do after I leave Washington? And it's just plain the fact that these guys are very impressive. Uh, as I, you know, like I said, they're, they're, they generally, Wall Street much more so even than other business people. They're, they're smart, they're often funny, they've got great tailors, and, they're, um, <laughs> um, and they, they can seem very impressive. And they, amazingly, they can seem impressive and like they know something, even if they almost destroyed the world just last year. So you can... So, so what's the political solution? You, you, he's right. right. They're raising, uh, President Obama himself right. was there raising money from, tried to raise it from Wall Street, turned out more executives that Wall Street's not so friendly right. at the moment. You've got a Democratic president. You've got Ben Bernanke, who you say wrote, in this situation, we should be doing what you're calling, and it's not happening. Right, so the, so I, I actually, in, in, in this depression now, I lay out some scenarios. Uh, one possibility is that, in fact, Obama, pulls off a, not only a, a, a re-election, but, but manages to get himself a, a Democratic Congress, which is not out of question. And then there, there's a lot of things. Then they can take a much more aggressive political line. They can, people forget that both of the big Bush tax cuts were passed using reconciliation. They never had a filibuster-proof majority for those things. They just used, used parliamentary maneuvers. Time to think about some parliamentary hardball on the part of the Democrats. Second possibility is he's got a Republican opposition. Uh, that, that controls one or both houses of Congress, in which case he just has to do a Harry Truman. He just has to keep pounding the do-nothing Congress, which is standing in the way, and, and do what the things he can do himself. Um, third is President Romney, uh, who you know, God knows what he actually believes. Uh, and, uh, and maybe, 
I mean, I don't place a lot of hope in this, and I certainly don't think that, you know, a, a, a good election slogan would be, you know, vote, vote for Mitt, he doesn't believe any of think he's, anything he's saying. Um, <laughs> but, um, but maybe, maybe, uh, maybe there's some possibility that, that in their own way they can do this. But it's, look, it's hard, but I, I don't see, I, I think that there's, there is a, at least a, a real possibility, not, a, not the most likely, but the real possibility that, that uh, come, come November, uh, actually, more come come next January that that a reelected President Obama will actually have uh, a political situation where, if he is daring enough and aggressive enough, he can pull put these things into effect. Sir, thank you for your question. Please. Hi, um, I work in the housing industry, and so I just wanted to um, ask a more targeted question, having to do with how um, I work with a lot of community lenders, and they've been complaining about the Dodd Frank regulations. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on. Um, that regulation and also um, how it could be possibly keeping young people with their large amounts of college debt, how that's affecting the economy. So it's kind of twofold, how you think the housing yeah. industry and the college debt. What are, what, what are people complaining about or concerned about with Dodd-Frank um, and the housing well, lending? Specifically field? when I meet with le lenders at community banks, they complain that um, people have to have 20% down in order to buy a house. And then also I think in order to refinance, you have to have 30% mm -hmm. uh, equity in your yeah. home and people are losing value. So they're having trouble. Yeah. So I mean, uh, on looking forward, you want those higher, uh, re those those higher um, uh, th those limits on loan to value ratio. You you really want those. Now the question is, can you do something right now? And uh, um, I haven't thought how about Dodd Frank exceptions. I actually just haven't worked it through. But but the 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 we're getting too deep into the weeds for people. But the Fannie Freddie. There's a lot of Fannie Freddie mortgages out there, and I'm I think we should waive all of those requirements temporarily just so we can get a refinance. This is a very special situation where, where the market interest rates are well below the interest rates lots of people are, are paying. It would be too enormously to our benefit to just make that happen. Um, so that's, that's the story. I mean, that student loans are somewhat similar. Now, the, the, uh, God, the, the circles I go into would say, well, it's only a trillion dollars. So, you know, but I guess a trillion here, a trillion there, and soon you're talking about real money. It's only more than uh, credit card debt. But it's, it's, a, it's a substantial. And if we can do, so, but I haven't, I haven't uh, studied that as well. I'm not sure if there's an equally easy workout. But yeah, I mean, in general, well, the best, probably the most, uh, the, the preponderance of the evidence is that the biggest single factor to keeping us where we are, keeping us in this, this depression, is the overhang of debt. Most of it is mortgage debt, student debt is part of it, credit card debt is part of it. We should be trying to find ways to bring down all of that. And what about the Republican argument that it's government lending for education that's actually driven to help drive up the cost of college, tertiary education? That's, you know, it's, um, uh, do you really think that state colleges and universities, which are, are the crucial things for, used to be the crucial things for making it affordable, that, the, that those, they've been raising their prices because of strong demand, that, 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 college, that state universities are, st state colleges are like soybeans? It's just, that's just, a, the, the big thing, I mean, there, there are underlying cost problems in education. Um, but the biggest thing driving up the cost has been the drastic cutbacks in the amount of, of state aid to education. We used to have, we used to have governments that invested, that believed that having a first-rate affordable education was, was, a, was an important part of building the future. We don't anymore. And that's, that's the story, not, not government lending. Thank you. Please. Sorry, just for a second. I know you have a lot of questions, so I'm going to give about five more minutes. Okay. okay. We'll be brisk, please. Hi. What do you think about the reading of your open ed on Argentinian economy by President Cristina Fernandez in the parliament. And my second question would be, uh, what do you think about the refusal of the Argentinian government to pay a compensation to Repsol? Okay, um, let me just weigh Could in. you bring us all up to date on Yeah, I, I put up a blog post just making a point, which is sort of familiar to people who are in this area, but, and so Argentina, Argentina had, Argentina is kind of a precedent for Euro breakup. Argentina had a system where one peso was one dollar, supposedly irrevocably, the convertibility law. And it was supposed to be something that could never, ever be broken. And finally, in, 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 in the midst of a banking crisis, it was. And Argentina, after one terrible year, had a brisk recovery. And, uh, and that's kind of a, a possible, you know, is, th is this the future of Greece? We talk about that. So I just put up a blog post because there was, there was this funny thing that, uh, that news reports on Argentina are always very negative, even though the fact of the matter is this past, uh, the, the decade since the end of the convertibility law is, 
is not such a terrible story. In fact, it's a story that a lot of Southern Europe would envy right now. Mm -hmm. Now, people respond by getting, is this an endorsement of all of the policies of the Kirchner government? No. It's certainly not an endorsement of what's obviously their, their policy of trying to lowball the inflation numbers. They're trying to, to confuse the, the story. And they, it, it has not been, they have not been as fiscally responsible, you know, they have not been fiscally responsible in recent years and so on. So it's not a wonderful government. Um, but it's, there are worse things. So what I was protesting against was this, let's put it, I think the flip sides. Um, Argentina, all news stories on Argentina portray it as a failure, although if you actually take a look at it, it looks kind of like a success. Not perfect success, but a success. Uh, all news reports on Ireland, almost all, until recently portrayed it as a success, when in fact if you look at it, it's a terrible failure. And the point being that Ireland, because it's done the right thing, followed the orthodoxy, should have been a success. So it's reported as if it were, even though it isn't. And Argentina, having done all the wrong things, should be an abject failure, and so it's reported as if it was, although it isn't. Um, if, you know, if, if a politician chooses this to... This is journalistic determinism, determinism right. or something. Right, well, and, and we've always been at war with East Asia. And um, the, um, no, so, so that's the point. Now, I think uh, there's always a risk, you know. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't police what politicians choose to, to extract from the things I write. Thank you. Please. Hi. First, just thank you for everything you're doing to help lead a movement for a just economy. Really appreciate it. So just a two-part question. Who is benefiting in the short term that we should most go after? Thank you for your exposure of ALEC. It has really helped. And then the second is you made me think about how in the 1980s the scientific community did actually play a huge role in convincing the powers that be that a nuclear war would not be in their interests. And do you see a parallel that we could make about the economy and the role of economists today? Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, boy, too much. I mean, if, uh, the, um, quickly, I, I think if you, if you were to ask who, um, economic policy does seem to favor the interests of, of rentiers, people who, who basically have, have cash and bonds. And uh, it's, uh, so you can think of that as being what drives it. Though, but uh, but uh, I think actually, it's not short-term interest. A, a lot of people on the right, it's kind of impressive. They play a very long game. They, they, uh, they, they spent 40 years building, building this, uh, this structure of misconception that is paralyzing us right now. So they're not just thinking about the short run. I wish, I think that economists could have been, played a very useful role here. I think if we had had uh, uh, the profession speaking with one voice, um, then we would have been doing better. This is a case where, but, but unfortunately the profession got terribly divided, I think for, for bad reasons. Um, I think we, we had a bit of runaway sociology uh, um, in, in within the economics profession as well. Um, there's actually a very interesting, uh, the political scientist Henry Farrell has a paper where he, he asks why, the, the initial response to the crisis, 2008 through early 2009, was actually pretty effective. And then it all fell apart. And he argues at least part of that was because uh, people like myself who believe in, the, in policy activism uh, were actually much more hooked into public affairs. And so in, for, for the first six months or so of the world going to hell, people who, who did want us to do something actually kind of monopolized the discussion. But unfortunately, <laughs> by, by, um, by some point in, the, in 2009, um, the, Everybody else, else caught up to that, and we had this cacophony of voices from the economists. That said, you can have overwhelming scientific consensus, and that doesn't necessarily work. Think about climate change. So, uh, um, actually, I sometimes, when people, when, when hard scientists complain to me about economists, and, and, and I say, you know, what you re hear about the discord, it's not all real economists. Think about climate change. One more. Thank okay. you. Well, I'm going to ask a question that's a little bit more lighthearted, and it um, regards you get a lot of heat from journalists and people in the center that you're too right. mean to some people who probably well for reasons that they're well compensated range from the stupid to evil uh, part right. of the spectrum, and you'll say mean things about them, and then the journalists will say, oh, if only Paul was nicer, and uh, more people would listen to him, and you had such a wonderful response this well. week. Yes, and people it was, didn't see it. For those who didn't see it, it was the Muppets singing feelings 
Uh, and my question is more about how do you find all these little snippets that you use from Monty Python to the Muppets to all these different little pop culture references that are yeah. like Joss Whedon-like to, uh, to yeah. basically make your points, and they're fantastic. Uh, don't, don't, I mean, there are search features and remembering stuff. <laughs> and um, You knew the Muppets sang feelings? <laughs> uh, I actually just thought I would have somebody singing feelings, and then I, I, it turned out that like number three on YouTube was, was the Muppets, and that was clearly the one to use. <laughs> there we were. <laughs> it has been a great evening. Uh, Paul Krugman, agree or disagree, it, it's pretty clear that you go above and beyond the call of duty, though the call of duty is pretty loud right now. <clears throat> and uh, but you you give more to the public discourse than you would have to and we are grateful for that. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for being here tonight. Thanks a lot.